Sycamore Row by attorney author John Grisham follows a Mississippi lawyer fighting for justice. It focuses on Jake Brygens, a fiction lawyer Grisham made popular in A Time to Kill, 1989. The legal thriller was praised for accuracy of its details around the South and practicing law, as well as for its characterization. The novel was met with great excitement as Grisham had not written about the popular character in nearly 25 years. Its themes include Southern culture, racism in the 1980s, deception, and forgiveness. The voice is third person on the present. The book, set in 1988, begins with the eccentric Seth Hubbard choosing, after battling terminal lung cancer for the past three years, to end his life. He elects to kill himself by hanging on a sycamore tree in Clanton, Mississippi. No one in town knows that Seth has secretly been saving loads of money while operating a lumber mill that was far more successful than anyone expected. Over the years, he's become a millionaire. But instead of leaving his wealth to his children or multiple ex-wives, Seth leaves it with Letitia Letty Lang, a black woman who cared for him during the last years of his life. However, his will is handwritten, and his chemotherapy drugs may have battled his judgment, there's going to be a great debate over whether or not the will, written in the last 24 hours of his life, is legally binding. A handwritten will, known as a holographic will, is usually legal in the state of Mississippi. The narrator shows that Seth's family is curmudgeon at best, racist at worst and greedy without a doubt. They're very loud, say stupid things, and have a mean opinion on everything. Seth knows that his family would only show any interest in him if they knew just how wealthy he was. Seth seems to have expected that his family would strongly object to his fortune being handed over to a black woman. Consequently, Seth sent his latest will and burial instruction to Jake Brygens. He tells Jake that his children aren't to know about this change until after the funeral, he gains a grim satisfaction from picturing them falsely mourning him and having no clue they've been cut from his will. Jake Brygens is a handsome, charming lawyer who has won cases that no one else thought he could. Yet three years after his landmark victory in the Carly Hiley case, a black man falsely accused of rape, Jake is renting a home with his wife and little daughter. During the Hiley trial, the Ku Klux Klan burned down his home, and he's still waiting for the insurance money. He decides to jump on the case because he can't keep skating off of the fame and wealth of the previous case, it's time to make a big splash once more. Seth's daughter and son and grandchildren point to two previously written and witnessed wills that left a sizable portion of his fortune to them. In fact, most of Clanton, including the judges and police officers, believe that the fortune should go to Seth's kin. But now, 90% is to go to Letty, so around $20 million, then 5% to a long-lost brother in Alaska, and another 5% to his church. To win the case, Jake decides to de-emphasize race. He knows the jury would be predominantly white, and he wants to keep people focused on the case itself, he will argue that Seth Hubbard worked hard to accumulate his own fortune, and he could dispense with it as he wished. Especially to someone with the upstanding morals and character witnesses of Letty. This last part gets complicated after Letty's estranged husband kills two teenagers while drunk driving. During this case, serving as the defendant, Jake is supported by Harry Rex, a nefarious divorce attorney, and Lucian, a disgraced and disbarred attorney. These outsider figures help Jake see the case in new and important lights. In cross-examinations, Jake exposes Seth's children for not really caring about their father by pointing to the fact they rarely visited him during his last three years of life. The prosecution then brings up two witnesses. One hints that Letty had sex with Seth Hubbard to get him to change his will, the other claims that she has a history of screwing with older people to try and get their money after they die. It looks like Jake won't be winning this case. Lucian travels to Juneau, Alaska, to encourage Seth Hubbard's long-lost brother, Ansel, to return to Clanton to testify. He left at 17 to join the U.S. Navy and vowed never to return, but hearing from Lucian that Letty may be denied the money, Ansel testifies. His testimony, which is recorded, shocks the courtroom. It turns out that Seth and Ansel's grandfather, Cleon Hubbard, stole land from Letty's unknown grandfather Sylvester. To justify the usurpation of property, Cleon arranged for Sylvester to be lynched on the same tree that Seth ended up hanging himself on. Cleon then burned the houses the black family had been living on and expelled them from the property. The jury declares that Seth Hubbard's will is valid. His children appeal. The judge awards them a very small amount, which Letty does not contest, with a fair portion going to set up a college fund for Letty's family. The novel concludes with Ansel finally returning to Clanton to have an emotional reconciliation with Letty and their past.
I hope you enjoy this video leave a like, if you didn't be sure to subscribe for more lore thank you all so much for your support.